Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the University of California, thank you for tuning in today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. My name is Hassan Akmal. I am a proud UCLA alumnus, former scholar athlete. Tennis was my sport at UCLA and the executive director of career and professional development at UC San Diego. Prior to UC San Diego, I was the executive director of the Career Center at UCLA, the executive director of industry relations and career strategies at Columbia University's Career Design Lab, and the director of business career services, the chair of career education and adjunct professor at Loyola University Chicago's B School. I've been in career services for 12 consecutive years, half as an executive director, I'm the author of How to Be a Career Mastermind, Discover Seven New Matter Lenses for a Life of Purpose, Impact, and Meaningful Work. Last year, this month, I delivered a TEDx talk entitled, entitled The Power to Design a Life You Love. I'm honored to be moderating today's webinar. This program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with the information, the insights, and connections necessary to launch, grow, or expand your career. Throughout, throughout today's session, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions or speakers by clicking the QA button on your screen. We will also try to answer as many questions as possible during the event. Our discussion today is focused on career and life pivots. Our panel will share personal experiences and insights along with tangible tips and advice to help you learn more about how to make a successful, how to make successful moves and explore new and meaningful paths for your career and life. During the past seven years, I've been leading ambitious reimaginations of career services at universities across the, United, across the United States, largely based on the current themes of meaningful work and purpose. Today's topic deeply resonated with me as career and life go hand in hand. You can't plan one without the other. We are talking about career and life design. I am joined today by three inspiring UC alums. Ben Fung is Chief Operations Officer of UpDoc, incorporated a business strategy, marketing agency, and human capital development firm specializing in health tech companies. Ben also serves as Chief Financial Officer of Recharge, a modern health and fitness company with the mission to redefine the healthcare experience by breaking down the silos of medicine, health, fitness, and wellness. As a physical therapist, he has experience in various clinical settings from acute care hospitals to community wellness to rural, to rural home health. His present professional focus is business development and digital marketing for healthcare, education, and technology. He received his master's degree in business administration at the University of Michigan, doctor of physical therapy degree at Azusa Pacific University and a bachelor's degree in bioengineering and psychology at the University of California, San Diego. He serves as a national spokesperson, spokesperson for, the, for the American Physical Therapy Association, is recognized as a research pioneer of contemporary kettlebell exercise, popularly seen in boot camps and CrossFit gyms, a subject matter expert in digital marketing and branding, and has been a lifelong student of martial arts with studies in Muay Thai boxing and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, Ben has taken up a strong interest in running, rucking, and home fitness. Our second panelist is Melody Gonzalez. Three months into her presidential appointment, serving in the Biden-Harris administration as executive director. White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics. She's a Warren College alumna who established her career in Washington, DC, served on the UCSD DC Alumni Club, and is a UCSD Alumni Association board member. Melody pivoted from her San Diego career working at the local NBC news station and the Chula Vista Convention and Visitors Bureau, Bureau to, DC, to DC's world of policy and politics. Her experience includes working for President Barack Obama's campaigns and administration, the US House of Representatives, then Congressman Xavier, Xavier Becerra, Arizona Congressman Raul Grijalva, 
Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda and the National Education Association. In her personal capacity, she's also an executive leadership coach, top of it all. During the pandemic, she rolled out Hope and Power Strategies, where she provides group and individual leadership coaching to bolster the capacity and resilience of leaders working to shape a brighter future for others and themselves. Our final panelist is Peace Uche, a double graduate of UC San Diego with a bachelor's degree in theater and biology and a doctorate of pharmacy. She's a public speaker, MC, podcast host, and educator in the non-fungible token NFT space. Peace transitioned from a corporate career as a doctor of pharmacy to realign as an NFT pivot and visibility coach. She is the host of Gold Den Meta Sessions <clears throat> with the Doc Peace podcast. In each episode, Doc Peace interviews NFT creatives who share their journey along with doses of inspiration on how they got started to empower listeners to achieve their own version of success with NFTs. She has been featured in Forbes and recently ignited the main stage at the North American Bitcoin Conference in Miami with Mark Cuban sharing five minutes of the spoken word. Ben, Melody, and Peace, thank you so much for being a part of today's webinar. Without further ado, let's dive into our first question. Are you ready? Every journey is unique, so let's start with your journey. Let's start, a, let's start off a conversation today by hearing a little bit more from each of you about your personal and professional journey and why this topic is important to you. Ben, why don't you kick it off? Thanks, Hassan. Um, my journey, uh, well, if we start with UCSD as an anchor, uh, I graduated in 06 uh, under the, uh, the BE back then, or now I think it's just BENG or BANG. Uh, depending on which generation you're um, associated with, with like Jacobs Engineering, all that stuff. That was kind of an anchor point. Um, you know, came into UCSD directly out of high school uh, and uh, eventually found my career path uh, pivoted for itself with decisions I didn't necessarily make. And that's something that we'll probably address later in this, uh, in this session together. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, it put me down into a soul searching mode, which is rather, uh, I guess, rather more common than less common in this comparative age. And, uh, you know, I went from a, a quite a bit of uh, loss and misdirection into more direction and then more loss and misdirection and, and following that cycle down to where I am now. So ultimately, um, you know, finding the world of physical therapy. Uh, finding that that was uh, you know, not entirely aligned with my personal uh, goals for my life, and then uh, finding more opportunities, and then just finding these uh, these micro pivots and some macro pivots, just to say, why not? Yes, let's just try this out and see how this goes. Um, and, you know, not all of it was hyper successful. Much of it was was really more fail fast and learn from those failures, uh, and realizing failure wasn't final. And then ultimately to where I am now with. Um, co-founding multiple companies uh, and having working, uh, been a remote worker, if you will, for, uh, you know, the, the better part of, you know, six, almost seven years. Um, and that's why this kind of uh, conversation and topic is important, because I find that uh, historically, the, you know, there's been this wisdom and, and uh, kind of adage where uh, it was passed down through, you know, times and, and kind of generations of learners. Uh, and, and, it was this idea that you could find a singular career uh, and, and that still does work. But for many, we're realizing that uh, it's not just one thing anymore. It, it, it's a hodgepodge of things that create the kaleidoscope or canvas of your life. Um, and, and I think that really liberates uh, the mind and the soul to, to really appreciate what life has to offer and what your career has to offer and recognizing that these are all uh, bits and pieces and, and steps along the way uh, so that you're not necessarily locked into one thing. And I find that that, that freeing moment uh, is truly, truly empowering. And so this conversation is, uh, you know, obviously a personal um, just bright point for me uh, to be able to share that, uh, be, but also to be able to help others find their own next right steps. I love it. Multiple careers over a career in life trajectory that could be 30 to 40 years. So multiple careers, uh, in a lifetime, not just a singular career. Melody, what about you? 
Yes, thanks, Hassan and the UC team for welcoming here. I love being able to kind of share my own journey because I think for me growing up, I never even knew that some of these ex opportunities existed. And so I'm really passionate about sharing them, encouraging people to pursue these areas of interest if it aligns with them. Um, you know, quite honestly, I never imagined that one day I'd be able to say I've had the honor of serving two presidents, a governor, two members of Congress, the Democratic caucus in the House of Representatives, uh, you know, I worked with the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, a coalition of 40 plus national Latino organizations and the National Education Association, which is the nation's largest union um, representing educators. And really, I moved to DC from San Diego after graduating from after graduating from UCSD. I worked about two years back home in San Diego with our chamber and our local NBC news station and dispelled that sort of itch to do more, to do good, and wasn't quite sure what that was until I came to a, a conference for work here in DC, picked up a brochure about Georgetown's Master of Public Pro Policy program, which was called a Master's for Do-Gooders. And I was just sold reading through that brochure that, that DC was what I needed to do next. And so I took a chance, hadn't been planning on applying for grad school that year. I had actually been planning on a journalism master's uh, the year after, but figured, hey, what the heck, I'll take a shot. And I was accepted. And so I left what was what I called the warm coast to the cold coast, and it has been just an amazing journey ever since. Um, and the more that I was here as a grad student and then starting to, to work on Capitol Hill and to be in this sort of political and policy space, the more I represented how, under, uh, how underrepresented voices like mine were in these areas and how much opportunity there is to do good um, and why, how important it is to have, you know, critically diverse voices involved in the policy of political space. And I think for me, you know, sometimes people see my career and they see my LinkedIn profile or my resume, everything seems very calculated and linear. But in reality, I think the, the jobs that I've had over the years were building off of each other and what was really true for me at the time. You know, and I think for me, there were really some pivotal sort of turning moments that I think about where, um, you know, when I finished with grad school, for example, I was trying to figure out what I would do next. Um, wasn't quite sure what that next fit would be. Um, and I wasn't sure how to break into the policy and political world. And I worked with our career counselors. And once I landed that job working with then Congressman Javier Becerra, they um, at one point shared with me my application. And it was fascinating to see that what was highlighted and circled that got me in the door for some of those early interviews were some of the tips that our career counselor on campus had shared. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to work on political campaigns. Once I got my job on Congress, I realized, you know, we needed to have more diversity there. And part of why we weren't as represented was because we needed to also be on the political side. So that's how I started organizing with my friends and coworkers um, to really organize for more diversity on political campaigns. I jumped on a campaign in Arizona, worked the Obama Biden campaigns, 08 and 2012. Um, I was just so moved because I think for me, po politics and political campaigns weren't just about electing the particular candidate for office, but it's really about community building. And uh, coming out of the, the 2012 campaign, I was approached to work with the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, where I stood up a program aimed at uh, encouraging Latinos to run for or pursue presidential and state level appointments, to encourage Latinas to run for office and to work on a number of different policy campaigns. And when I least uh, expected it, I ended up getting a call to work and to interview and then uh, uh, ultimately serve in the Obama administration. So I had a chance to start working with the US Labor Department then under the leadership of Secretary Tom Perez at one of the sub agencies as the chief of staff and ended that term as uh, deputy chief of staff for the US Office of Personnel Management. The White House in those days had a fantastic leadership development team, which is also modeled now in this administration that did a lot of workshops. I took advantage of every chance I got. I went to the career workshops, the leadership development workshops, and one of the trainings, they, they had us do this exercise on the spot. So I would challenge all of you with us to think about this and identify, you know, what are maybe three to five values or traits that you really want to see in your next job? So rather than thinking of the title or the place, you know, it's like, jot down a few things that are important to you. And so at that time I thought, you know what, I wanna do good. I wanna make sure I'm making some money. I want to be with good people and I want to have some semblance of life. And people said, Mel, you're crazy. I don't know that you can get all of that. You don't know that you can get all of that in DC, but those were my checklist items. And so every job opportunity that came up that I saw on LinkedIn or other places, I cross-checked with that. And I ended up getting three job offers on one day, which was wild. 
and was able to use that checklist to decide what that next step was. And that's where I decided to go with the National Education Association, was with them about four years. And once President Biden won up, you know, and stepped into, so step, getting ready to step into office, a former colleague reached out, invited me to be part of the Biden-Harris transition team. So I had a chance to work through December, January. It's technically a volunteer role, but uh, helping prepare the new administration for the first 100 days. And I just got the bug. I knew that there was some way I could be helpful in this next administration. I, again, came back to my core values of doing good with good people, you know, trying to have a life. Um, and just kind of was trying to keep an eye out for what that next opportunity might be. This was all during the pandemic time where teleworking from home. And uh, a friend happened to be in a meeting where they heard they were collecting resumes uh, in the White House for this role and asked if I you know, wanted to put my name and I did and went through the interview process started mid-December. So for those that are wondering, I know I looked at some of the questions in the, that came in for this event, people are wondering what it's like to transition during the pandemic. I'm here to say it can be done. Um, I'm here to encourage you to follow your heart's desires because you know those things that you can do, that you want to do, that you know you have to offer the world are available for you now. And don't let teleworking or this pandemic moment hold you back. The world needs you in whatever sector and space you want to be in. Love it. The world needs you. Uh, that definitely resonates. And, and I love how you took your career choice circle and instead of focusing on titles, you focused on things like core values and skills, and you were able to make some of those power moves during the pandemic. Peace, what about you? Tell us your story. Yes, greetings, everyone. Greetings. Thank you so much for hosting and providing this space for us to share our stories. Stories are very powerful indeed. So we are all on our own individual journeys. We have unique experiences throughout our life roads, and it is indeed an honor to share these golden moments. They serve to pave respect and to show gratitude to what led you to your current state. I am a three-time graduate of UCSD. I went to school uh, at UCSD for nine years, graduated with my very first degree in a, with a BS in biology, then went on at UCSD School of Pharmacy to graduate with a doctorate in pharmacy, and then continued onwards to complete an ambulatory care residency program at the UCSD affiliate hospitals. I am a public speaker now and an MC, pivot and visibility coach. I'm a radio and podcast host and spoken word artist, as well as an NFT enthusiast. So it's been quite a journey to arrive here. And I'd like to share some moments from my life road here with you all today. So creating an online based business has fully transformed my life. I've experienced firsthand what it feels like to transition from a corporate career, the doctor of pharmacy, to realign with my sole purpose. And I'm noticing there's a theme here in all the panelists here, this, this uh, theme of realigning with our sole purpose. And mine is to help others align with their sole purpose and achieve their own version of success, not somebody else's, but your own version of success, because my version of success is going to look different from yours. Ben's version of success is going to look different for him. Melody's version of success. They're all, we're all, we all have different variations of what success looks like, what success feels like. For the past two years, I supported others in their transformational journeys. I helped them create and launch a high ticket offer. This new life that I had created for myself and others it was absolutely gold and I wanted more. Gold is actually a powerful acronym that I created. It's more than just the color, it's an embodiment of who we are. Gold stands for genuine, original, loving dreamer. And I believe that whether you know it yet or not, we are all gold, genuine, original, loving dreamers. And it might take you some time, some experiences, maybe a couple pivots for you to realize that and align with what it is that makes you truly light up and align with what it is that makes you a golden being. So when I was 12 years old, I wrote my very first book. It's called The Midnight Show. It rhymed. It was super inspiring. But I forgot about that little girl. I forgot about her. I was told that I couldn't make a living as an artist, that the only respectable or um, supported careers that I could take 
would have to be either a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. These were the only things that, that I could do in order to feel supportive for my family. Um, it was the only guaranteed careers that I could actually succeed and make money from. So that little girl that wrote this first, this book, The Midnight Show, it, this was a, the beginning of something and it was shut down. So it wasn't until almost 20 years passed before I reactivated the spoken word artist within me. And I began flowing spoken word. And in 2018, this is when I began flowing what I call spoken word, which is, um, when I don't call it spoken word, it's transformational rhythmic poetry, which is the best way to describe it if you haven't yet experienced it. And I even published this inspirational picture book that my 12 year old self wrote, which actually became a bestseller. So this book was about how all the sky lights up and how all of nature stops and watches this incredible light show. And it's akin to how when we start to shine our light, the world will take notice. And it's paired with Van Gogh inspired art pieces with poetic lines. And I wrote this when I was 12. So spoken word was a bridge that allowed me to transition from my comfortable supported cor corporate life as a pharmacist to the exciting and uncertain at times world of entrepreneurship. So spoken word has always been what grounds me and I've always had a calling to do more with this gift. So since I was introduced to NFTs on non-fungible tokens, this happened about a year or so ago, it's been a whirlwind of excitement. My journey began the evening I invested in two dozen sets of Gary Vaynerchuk's book, 12 and a half. Since then, I found myself consuming as much NFT content on socials as I could find, binging podcasts, reactivating my Twitter account. I began connecting with the NFT community and I quickly found that this is where I wanted to be. So since I went all in and pivoted into this NFT space, so much has quickly transpired, including pivoting my radio show to feature only NFT creatives and relaunching as golden meta sessions with Dog Peace. I've been also a featured speaker at NFT events. Most of the major NFT events I've had the privilege of igniting these events or emceeing these events or being part of these events, covering these events for my podcast. I'm present and I'm connecting with the NFT community and providing value in this way. I've also been featured in Forbes magazine for an, a four part prescription on how to transform your mindset from powerless to powerful. I flowed my very first NFT spoken word flow freedom with NFTs on Gary Vaynerchuk's stage to close out his event. And since then I've been booked to flow spoken word MC and speak at the most well-known events and conferences in the NFT space, including the North American Bitcoin conference with Mark Cuban. I've dropped an NFT collection for The Midnight Show, the very book that started it all when I was 12. I've invested in golden NFT products that I align with, connect with thousands of NFT enthusiasts all over the world, collaborating with large scale NFT brands and products to highlight their vision and mission. And the list goes on and on. And I'm sharing this with so much excitement and passion because I feel like I've completely aligned with my purpose. And it started off with allowing myself to do that first initial pivot. And since then, I've given myself permission to pivot a couple different times after that. And it gets easier to allow yourself to, to make those slight adjustments or fairly large adjustments in your life so that you can more closely align with your sole purpose, the reason why you are here. And that leads us to this very moment. Peace. <clears throat> you know, I, I knew this was going to be a power panel, but you're taking it to a whole different level. You're pivoting my mind. Um, I'm thinking uh, gold mind right now. Defining your vision is like excavating gold. First, you need to believe that the gold is in the ground. Some of us have self-doubt, but once you believe it's there, you start digging. So thinking of your mind as a gold mine, when you excavate gold, you sift through the dirt and the gold that's heavier stays at the bottom. The dirt comes out, the gold shines. This is the same process that we're going through when it comes to the clarity of vision, career and life vision. This is about digging, digging deep into our why. I love it. Let's move on to the next question. You've each made pivots in your career and life. And I wanna talk about what kind of advice you have uh, for others based on those experiences. And I was gonna ask a, a follow-up question about kind of what the UC system sort of, play, what role the UC system played 
in your career and life progression. So, if, but be, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and add that to this piece. If you can maybe talk a little bit about what role the UC system played in your career and life progression, um, and what advice you have through those experiences, through those pivots. Uh, Melody, why don't you kick it off? Sure. A, a few things come to mind, and I'll kind of take into mind some of the questions that are coming in, like what's an ideal age to make a career pivot? How do you handle positions like presidential appointments, which you know do have a come with an expiration date when the president's term's over, your job is over as well? Um, you know, I think a few things that I've learned personally, but also like through leadership coaching trainings I've been through and supporting and mentoring and coaching others is a few things. So I'd share one recommendation is just to remember that your mindset is everything. Um, you know, our brains are constantly filtering and creating stories. And so we need to notice what stories are serving us, what stories are holding us back, what stories do we need to let go of. And when it comes to the job hunt, if you're getting stuck or feeling in a rut, come back to ask yourself, you know, what are your thoughts? How might you shift your thoughts? How might that change the actions you take, the feelings that are generated and then shift to different results? Sometimes when we feel like we're stuck and in the same place, it's because we're stuck in this mindset that's holding us back. So I think that's really critical. And you know, I share that because there were times where I applied for jobs that I really wanted and they didn't work out. And so what you don't see on the resumes or LinkedIn is are all the opportunities where people said no to me. But you've got to find that way to say, you know what, I'm capable. I know that I have a lot to offer. Let me just try a different approach. And so for me, that was, you know, leaving a job of six years on Capitol Hill to go work on a political campaign and take that sort of calculated chance. And that actually spun me out into a new cycle of more senior roles that I was invited to interview in. I'd also say it's important to really be clear on your values. You know, I spoke earlier about, you know, those, those that I identified for myself, but really get clear. And I think this is something so many of us are doing during this pandemic era. You know, not only what do you want in your job, but also what do you want in your life? What do you need in terms of your health and wellness, your environment? And then look at the job opportunities that will create not just the professional experience you want, but the professional and lifestyle experience that you want. Um, you know, I think for me too, another thing that's really important is um, asking for help. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's so hard for folks, but it's one of the most important thing. Ask yourself, what support do you need? You know, who are the different people around you that might offer different support? Sometimes people might fall into a trap of thinking, I only need to talk to people that can give me technical assistance, or maybe they get disheartened if they're not able to get a coffee break with all of these people that they think could open doors. But the reality is there are a lot of people around us who can offer help in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, so challenge yourself. Maybe some of the supports that you need are social, uh, people that will root you on or, um, you know, be there for you when you need to vent or come up with different strategies or encourage you to get those outreach emails. Um, you know, I know for me, sometimes there were times where for my job progression, I'd have to reach out to more senior people who could maybe help open doors or put in a good word. Sometimes with the political and policy jobs, you don't actually see a job posting. So people need to know your story and be able to help lift your story in other spaces where you don't even know the conversations are being had. Um, you know, and so I'd even have to rally myself up to say, okay, you know, let's, let's play different games. Let's say, okay, you know, sometimes I just rally myself and say, okay, I am not going to get off my computer today until I email these three people and say, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's get those emails out. Or sometimes when I was job hunting in between some of the campaigns, which do end and you've got to, you know, hit the, hit the ground running in terms of finding new jobs, I'd set weekly goals. And I might think about, you know, who's somebody I could try to meet with this week on the technical assistance front who might be somebody that I could connect with that might be in the fields or organizations I'm interested in, that could be more of a social coffee or chat. Um, you know, and so think about what helps you operate best when it comes to seeking support, create a little strategy or a little game for yourself and make it fun. So this way, you know, you're not letting yourself to get deflated, but rather you're balancing that technical job hunt with other sort of connections with people who can refill you and re-energize you. And I think for me, you know, the UC system, UCSD community has really been a part of, of that sort of support of refilling and re-energizing me. Um, when I was on campus, I loved the support that we got from Oasis, the Summer Bridge program, which I had a chance to work on. It was such a creative space on campus, I think, to for me to explore my love from theater to, you know, being an RA or working at The Guardian and doing internships. Um, some of those relationships I've been able to keep, you know, and, and, and carry to this day. And when I came to DC, 
I was able to connect with the DC Alumni Club and it was just such a nice experience to connect with people who carry a little bit of the California vibe and are navigating this world that can be, you know, oftentimes complicated. And, you know, we find ways to support each other, whether it's, you know, through the meetings that we had or social events, um, you know, even just being able to reach out to each other for official work. And now I'm really grateful to be able to serve on the UCSD Alumni Association Board. So at the national level, the board is just amazing, you know, a network of leaders that are UCSD alum working in so many different sectors, sometimes people I might not ever otherwise have had a chance to cross paths with, but all with just good heart, genuine passion for community and for students. And I think in particular during this pandemic time, you know, it's really helped, um, you know, give me a connection to serve back home with alongside really great people. Wonderful. Thank you, Melody. That's inspiring. Peace. And then Ben. Yeah, such great golden nuggets there, Melody. Thank you so much for that. So one of the things that I'm really big on is taking an inventory of gifts, expert skills, and talents. In fact, about a few months ago, I was invited as a volunteer speaker at UCSD School of Pharmacy to come and speak to the P1s, the first year pharmacy school students on how I was able to utilize or leverage a lot of the skill sets that I learned in pharmacy school and during my corporate pharmacy experiences working half a decade in the pharmacy world before I pivoted and how I'm utilizing them now. And so I spent about an hour and a half or so dialing in on some skill sets that I learned throughout that journey and exactly how I'm applying them now as a coach and as a speaker. And so this question is very, very hits home because it's, it's exactly what I find that many people are wondering. When you pivot, you are not saying goodbye forever. <laughs> uh, you're not saying, you're not dismissing those experiences and those skill sets that you learned. You're more so transferring those skill sets to a different place. And so to kind of give you a, a, a solid exercise as to what to do when, if you are considering pivots, and I saw some questions come through here in our chat. For someone who is beginning to explore their potential pivot, I would recommend spending time creating an inventory or what I call a gratitude list, a golden gratitude list of your gifts, your expert skills, and your talents. So to clarify the distinction between these three segments, a gift is something you are innately born with. When I, when I share, or shared earlier, one of my innate gifts was the ability to poetically flow. I mean, I wrote a book when I was 12, that was a poetic book. And so think on like certain elements of your life growing up where you have been told, wow, you do this so very well. And maybe you've dismissed those com compliments thinking that everyone can do that but that's not true though. That's one of your gifts. So list out at least three, three to seven of your gifts that you've been innately born with, and then go down to your expert skills. So expert skills are things that you may have picked up working in the corporate world, your nine to five job, things that you have been trained to do. And now you can do them with your eyes closed. And again, the reason why we're honing in on these skill sets is because they can be transferred into the next segment of your life, of your journey. And then lastly are your talents, things that you felt very drawn to spend much of your time and energy, hours upon hours, training, honing these talents. List these out because they're going to allow you, this entire gratitude list is going to allow you to now take that next step and pivot into something that ties in money, much of these elements. Be, this is what's going to allow you to really align with your soul purpose. There's a reason why 
you have these gifts, that you've acquired these skill sets, that you have this draw to hone on the, in on these talents. And I honestly do that no one has the exact same set of gifts, expert skills, and talents as you do. And so if you're not sharing those gifts, expert skills, and talents in the only way that you know how, you're doing a disservice to not only yourself, but to others, because no, no one else will be able to experience what you and only you can provide. So with that being said, once you've created that inventory list, some of the things that Melody touched on was the importance of really empowering your mindset. And this is something I've been very passionate about. In fact, um, I, as I shared earlier, was re recently submitted and featured in Forbes magazine for a, a four-part prescription on how to transform your mindset from powerless to powerful, even when it feels impossible. And I recommend that those listening go back and read that article because it's very powerful. And so one of the things that's really important as you give yourself permission to transition or pivot is to really have in mind the uh, the importance of having a fertile mindset. So this comes to, I want to share briefly the seed theory of mind and a seed contains within it the potential to turn into something beautiful and unique. Thoughts are like seeds and like seeds, thoughts hold the potential to become something incredible and to reach your fullest potential, but only if you have that fertile mindset, that you have that that the empowered mindset, the, the confidence in your own gifts, your expert skills and talents, because we all know that a watermelon seed, if planted in fertile soil, will grow into a watermelon. A pumpkin seed, if planted in fertile soil, will grow into a, a pumpkin, but it needs to have that fertile soil, that fertile mindset to grow. And this is what's so important because if without a fertile mindset, without this, uh, this empowerment, these loading up your empowerment tool chest, as I like to call it, with things that actually boost your confidence in your, in your abilities, you'll have opportunities and experiences come your way, but you, will, you may not feel fully present. You may not feel ready to receive these opportunities and you'll let those opportunities pass you by. So this is why it's so very important to have that fertile mindset. And I just want to end this segment here with some ways, specific ways to give yourself permission to pivot. The first one is to set your intention. Set your intention on the direction that you choose to go, the direction that you want to explore. And the very first step, like I shared earlier, was giving yourself time and energy and space to create this gratitude list the inf take an inventory of your gifts, your expert skills and talents, because that's gonna give you some direction as to what direction to go next. And then secondly, believe in yourself fully. There is a reason again, why you were gifted with these gifts, these expert skills and talents that have come your way that you've honed in on. There's a reason for this. You have so many gifts and skill sets and talents to share. And when you really hone in and believe that you truly are here for a reason, that you truly do have this purpose in life and your this inventory list, this gratitude list is what's gonna help you align, that really does help to boost your confidence moving forward. And then lastly, set yourself up for success. Melody touched on this earlier. Align with those who you know that can get you to the next step that can help encourage you, that can help coach you, that can help facilitate your growth and your journey moving forward. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for support. We're all in this together and we all want to see each other succeed. So it's very important to reach out, let people know what you're welcoming support with so that they can provide that support. This is all part of giving yourself permission to pivot. Love it. There's enough success for everybody, right? Uh, ben, we're, we're uh, just a heads up, we're about 20 minutes left, so we're going to try to speed through some of these other questions because the chat is blowing up, the questions are blowing up. We already got over a dozen or so, uh, so I want to ma make sure we get, we get a, have a little bit of time to tackle those. Well, I'll try to weave some of my uh, thoughts with some of the questions that have popped up. Um, you know, in no specific order, there's been some some questions about uh, transitioning to at home or remote work or hybridized work, what the norms might be. Uh, there's some thoughts in terms of uh, security, 
Um, you know, there, there is uh, some some discussion needed in terms of uh, of lateral transfers and how that affected your salary. Um, some growth mindset talks and uh, you know the, the MBAs. And there's just so much to talk about. Um, all to say, uh, when, when I first made my you know, like the first pivot I made was moving from the uh, the engineering field into healthcare. Uh, and, and that came just from somebody going, hey, you should try volunteering since right now you are a San Diego surf bum slash bartender. <laughs> and that was somewhat of a choice <laughs> and, and somewhat of a just, a, you know, like engineering wasn't for me anymore. I still use engineering in my work every single day, uh, which is kind of cool to say, but it wasn't, um, you know, uh, some of this wasn't purposeful on my part. Uh, not until far later in life. And uh, I started volunteering at a clinic uh, and decided, well, physical therapy is a life for me. So I'm going to go <laughs> figure out how to apply to grad school and that kind of stuff. And, and, and that pattern started to kind of uh, show itself. And so ultimately I decided to seek mentorship and I, I did so in the form of uh, more or less uh, complaining to my hospital CEO, uh, and he was very wise and, and very uh, generous, um, very gracious to me, and redirected that angst into why don't you make something more of yourself. Um, it, it essentially came to me of like, well, I, I, I've gone through school times two now, uh, you know, I have a doctorate level education, shouldn't this be enough? Uh, and his challenge to me was, you know, to look beyond the title and the path into what you can actually do in a tangible way to make an impact to the world around you and for the people around you. Uh, and that was a, a very different uh, thought process than uh, you know, get into college and you'll be okay, get into grad school and then you'll be okay, just make the grade and then you'll be okay into uh, taking some tangible steps. And that might seem very basic <laughs> at, at, at first, but um, when you entrench yourself uh, into academia for so long and even so long could be just even two years, uh, it, it can be difficult to dig your mind and soul out of that. And so that level of mentorship with a couple of, of touch points really changed the way I gauged into that. Um, and then, uh, you know, with that, you know, I'll echo the thoughts of, you know, surrounding yourself with, with like-minded people that the people that have that growth mindset that aren't afraid of your success, because that can be a, a difficult environment, um, you know, when, when you have uh, that negativity involved based on, you know, wh whatever you want to call it, uh, envy or toxicity or what have you, um, is to, to really just surround yourself by what you want to see more of. You know, there's, there's plenty of destructive forces in the world. Being constructive is always a little bit more challenging, but also that much more rewarding. Um, you know, and, and in terms of how that uh, looped in, um, the direct challenge from my, my hospital then CEO uh, was to get an MBA so that I could be part of higher level conversations in healthcare. And that's exactly what happened, uh, was, was having that created for me uh, sort of collateral um, and clout that I could actually talk to health executives in a meaningful way where they didn't just see me a fair or unfair uh, as just a clinician or just a provider uh, that I understood the business of healthcare as much as I did the, the, the operational frontline patient facing aspects of it. Um, you know, and, and that naturally turned into a work from home situation, which took quite a bit of, of digging and, and, and soul searching and, and much risk, mind you, like it wasn't like, well, I'll just turn the corner and fund myself. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of financial risk involved from, in terms of starting companies and working from home. And it becomes one of those things of, it's a difficult conversation that you have to have with yourself where you have to realize that the, the certain grades of, of stability are, are a combination of, of, uh, of perception and, and what levels of tolerance you're willing to have in your life. And you really have to... Um, you really have to have that talk and, and and to come to truth of matter moments where you go, you know what, this is more important. You know, um, there's a, uh, if spending time uh, with your loved ones is more important then that is your goal. And, and that, that becomes uh, more of a true North amongst various uh, compass points to guide your career and your life, which are becoming that much more one and the same. Uh, and it is very freeing because then it doesn't mean that you're locked in. And, and it, it's interesting because people will ask me like, well, don't you feel like you wasted your degree or you know that kind of stuff? And like, no, because I, I use you know, my, my healthcare degree all the time. I use my engineering degree every single day and I use my business degree every single day, uh, day and it becomes a part of who you are uh, rather than, than what you do. 
So that that's a couple of thoughts in terms of uh, advice points for those that are um, looking to pivot, and uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that's helpful in, in some respect. No, definitely, and 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 a quick follow up to that, Ben. So as we prepared for this panel, we discussed your career journey as as a good example of the adage, and you mentioned that earlier. So if you don't plan to pivot, life will pivot for you. In, in her book, Pivot, author Jenny Blake argues, careers are fundamentally tied to our livelihood and sense of confidence, meaning, and purpose. These transitions can be traumatic without a roadmap for traveling them. You live this. Instead of resisting, you embraced it. How did you exchange uncertainty for adventure? Well, it, it comes back to that, uh, that true north, you know, you, you have to decide for yourself and those that are with you, you know, stakeholders in your life, if you will, um, you all have to kind of come to this moment. Uh, and I, won't, I don't want to call it consensus, but just realization of what is really most important. And that can change. That's the thing is, I think pivoting is, is, is really becoming that much more the norm, at least what we think of as pivoting. Um, very, very often, I think the historical view of pivoting is, is like rebooting your life from zero. And that's really not the case. You're just building in a different direction. And so I certainly gave up that kind of corporate life stability piece for something that was very uncertain. You know, nobody knew if this, you know, any one of the companies I was uh, founding at the time were going to be financially successful. Uh, and, you know, and, and depending on, on, uh, you know, which Monday and pre or post coffee that you ask me, I don't know if it's going to be successful today, you know, and, and that's okay, because that isn't necessarily my true north, I'm building towards other goals. Uh, and, and many of them, uh, kind of as alliterated are very personal. Uh, and, and it's also kind of coming to the fact that, yes, you know, certain uncertain things are, are rather uncomfortable, but you kind of have to be comfortable being uncomfortable to, to reach and breach certain stratospheres and, and, and even some glass ceilings. And adventure is a great word for that, it is I wouldn't trade anything for the kind of life that I get to have now uh, because I'm able to do these things and, and what might've felt as whimsical maybe five, 10 years ago are just normal for me now. You know, it, it's not uncommon at certain times for me to take uh, like a client consulting call from Galaxy's Edge or Star Wars Land at Disneyland, and just kind of like, well, that's normal, <laughs> you know, and and that will happen, uh, and, and that's and just kind of a, a you know kind of a an example of of where that adventure uh, can lead you, and that's really just a, a like a very surface level perk of of, uh, of what can happen, um, but embracing it really it, it comes to almost an existential. Uh, point of framework where you have to ask yourself why you know you start with why which is a famous uh, famous phrase and book I believe by Simon Sinek and you just you start with the why of what you're doing you know and then you come to how uh, and that creates a very positive circle where a, a lot of the barriers uh, become self-removed when you keep chasing that uh, that question um, until you hit a no uh, you know and then you realize what is truly uh, valuable and what is the priority in your life uh, and everything else kind of just uh, it's nice and it's a it's a little bit I, I apologize it's a little bit soft to say it this way but uh, it, it kind of does melt away uh, where you realize that the uh, the uncertainty is just a different uh, grade of tolerance there's my engineering again you know <laughs> usually engineers are very precise things uh, but life isn't precise and, and and then you start to become that much more confident uh, and comfortable with uh, larger confidence intervals of what can happen in life. And, and truly that, that brings not just a sense of adventure, but I think it brings a, a sense of joy uh, and happiness and uh, accomplishment. I love it. Well, we, we're going to keep moving on and uh, let's talk about uh, Melody. Let's talk about power moves. Uh, we're going to have to keep the answers just to maybe two to three minutes max. But let's talk about your power moves. A power move is a, is a courageous decision that forces one to confront their limiting beliefs and fears. We have lots of those. In the chat, I'm getting private messages, people who, who consider themselves as a security seeker. They're very cautious. During the pandemic, you made a bold one, one that was likely self-affirming, and it pushed you out of your comfort zone. And it also altered your career trajectory. How did you determine the time was right for such a bold move? Well, I think for me, you know, I just really felt the urgency of the moment. I saw and felt the, the harm that so many in this country experienced over the past several years. 
including in particular that were exacerbated around the pandemic. And yet at the same time, I also saw beautiful moments of hope um, through how educators and students and communities and families were organizing to make sure that all of their basic needs were met, that learning continued, whether school buildings were having to close or later reopen. Um, I saw how powerful it was when I volunteered with the Biden-Harris transition, went to see so many people, brilliant minds from, you know, all kinds of backgrounds coming together to, to really move towards a, a, a brighter future. Um, it's, it's just really moving. And so I kind of, you know, I, I, I resonate with peace, what you were saying about the gifts and expert skills and talents. It's like, I knew I had those to offer. And then I felt your sense of adventure. Um, you know, and I think for me, I just really knew that I could be a part of, of the healing and the recovery work that was so needed. And so I would really encourage, you know, those of you that might be interested in policy and politics to really step up. This is a critical moment right now, and there are historic opportunities. There's historic federal funding going out, um, historic opportunities for jobs as well. Um, so I just want to make a plug. You know, I think when it comes to making bold moves in the government, if you want to become a presidential appointee, uh, whitehouse.gov has a section called join us put your resume in. you don't want to wait for a job to come up put your resume in now this way you are in the bank you can research jobs that you like by looking at what is called the plum book it is a snapshot of what jobs existed in one moment in time for each of the past four presidential or the past uh, presidential cycles you can start to research agencies and offices and jobs that interest you um, for those that might be working in state local government or tribal governments or institutions of higher ed. I know many of you are in uh, or nonprofits. There's also this intergovernmental personnel act that allows you to basically get work out a partnership with a, an agency and get details into the federal government. And there are internship and paid internship and fellowship opportunities to serve in government. We need you. We need more diverse voices helping plan the policies, programs, funding. Um, and it's really exciting because the president just signed on Friday a bill that includes $4.5 million to fund White House internships. These had always been unpaid before, which we know created huge equity issues. So for those of you that know young people, have them apply for these White House internships. Um, and I'm happy to share our website so you can join our newsletter and get connected. But in terms of boldness, too, I'd also speak to the financial piece just briefly. You know, yesterday was Women's Equal Pay Day. I have a, the incredible privilege and honor of being able to join the president and first lady of the White House for a Women's History Month celebration. And it marks the day that uh, basically women are paid 83%, 83 cents to the dollar that men are earned. So it takes women a whole year plus all the way up until yesterday to earn what men earned last year. And when it comes to women of color, that pay gap is even worse. For Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and the Pacific Islander women, equal pay day is May 3rd. For black women, equal pay day is September 21st of this year. And for Native women, it's November 30th. For Latinas, equal pay day is December 8th. And so when we think about taking bold risks for jobs, I think we also need to be bold when it comes to negotiating for the pay benefits and environment that we want That's right. and that we deserve. Thank you, Melody. So important. So we have about five minutes left. I have one targeted question for Peace, and I want to make sure she has the opportunity to share. So Peace, everybody has a story. Stories are inspiring, they're powerful, and they're transformative. But inner storytelling sometimes holds us back from that pivot because we're scared. And it's an automatic process that many times we don't even realize is happening. You have to catch yourself in the moment and ask, what is the story about yourself that you tell yourself? You have a special story and storytelling empowered you through your transitions. Let's talk about those. How did you become a story maker and a story changer in two to three minutes or less? Dr. Peace Uche, we have to let you go. This is the moment my life completely changed with these nine words. And after spending my entire pharmacy career, investing all my time, energy, and skill sets working half a decade managing pharmacy formularies for Fortune 500 companies, I was being laid off. Talking about being forced to pivot. <laughs> I was shocked, embarrassed, and terrified of what was to come. I had put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears working for a tyrant of a company. After years of working mandatory overtime up to 70 hour weeks, all behind a computer screen with little vacation, two weeks a year, I was tired. I had recently switched jobs and had spent the past year learning new systems, completing countless projects, and it was never enough. 
I know may, many of you may have felt this way before. And I was now being told, Dr. Peace Uche, we have to let you go. And I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to manage my own time. I wanted to manage, I wanted to have location freedom. I wanted financial freedom. And I've always been one to push boundaries. And I knew, I knew I had to get it going. So I didn't want to fail or be a disappointment. But what stood in the way of getting what I wanted was that I didn't know what options that I had. I had student loans to pay off. This reality was that I could either start at another company and try to fit in, into their company culture or try something new. For me, emotionally, I felt unfulfilled, stuck and trapped in this rat race. Back then I felt like I was in between a rock and a hard place. I kept keep doing what I'm doing because it was all I knew or I could venture off and try something different and explore the unknown. But again, I've always been one to push boundaries and explore the unknown and get it going. And now, now that I've given myself permission to pivot, I feel complete happiness and a sense of accomplishment. So my biggest takeaways from this situation was that I was not in full control of my life back then. I needed to take the driver's seat and I needed to get in control. And so I did. This was the first of my three main pivots. And now, now that I pivot fully into the Web3 space, I'm finding that I'm in more in alignment with my purpose. For, so for those of you who are curious as to what this Web3 space looks like, I encourage you to get on Twitter, which is where the Web3 or NFT community predominantly is, and start connecting with those in the space. What the Web3, the Web1 space was when their internet first came out. Web2 is, was when social media first came out and you could you had a part in the internet creation. Web3 is now where not only are you, can, are you able to take part in the creation of what's on the internet, but now you own it. And so it's bringing about this new phase of this is a historical shift in time, and we're still just getting started. So there's space for you. There's room for you here in this community. And I want to encourage you to start getting it going in the space. And one of the ways you're going to be able to do so is by identifying again, what your gifts, your expert skills and talents are and applying that into this new world. Love it. Love it. And there's some, there's some questions that, um, that came to me that talk about kind of taking a part-time job first or, or kind of concerns about the financial, um, you know, status before you make a pivot or trying something out first. Um, you know, I would say experiences lead to transformation, which creates stories that inspire action, which ultimately leads to fulfillment. Um, let's go ahead and take at least one question from the audience. Here's one. As far as financials, this comes from Nicole, and it's for peace. As far as financial status, when you pivoted, did you automatically jump from one job to the other? Uh, did salary benefits increase? Financial obstacles too often prevent Blacks and women from leaping. How were you financially affected as you shifted? This is a great question. And one of the benefits that I had when I was forced to pivot that first time was that I had already, I had get set myself up in such a way that I had significant amount of savings. I had um, enough money to continuously pay off the loans that I had accrued during pharmacy school. So I was set up in a way that I was financially available uh, uh, I was financially able to be able to make a means and baseline means, right? I had enough for my living. I had enough for, for, for the, 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 what I needed in order to live. Um, and so I'd also set my intention on achieving and creating an online based business to provide continuous income. And I gave myself six months in order to be able to do so based off the savings that I had accrued. So when you are figuring out if you want to pivot, I highly encourage you to set up your financial uh, assets so that you have room, you have the time, you set yourself an intention on what, on what you need to achieve in order to be able to sustain that new life. So it's no longer as stressful because it's already relatively stressful in making this pivot. So when you set yourself up financially, it takes off it removes one of those one of those variables 
Yes, and there was one more question uh, for Ben. Uh, to those with an MBA, how vital was obtaining an MBA in terms of opening doors and growing your career path? Did it play a significant role in any of your pivots? It was actually to Ben and myself. I did drop my part of the answer in the chat earlier, but Ben, any advice? Well, the MBA is, there's a blog article that circulated a while ago I wrote to MBA or not to MBA. And, and really it's, um, you know, to, to be very straightforward about it, you know, the MBA, it doesn't really matter where you're getting it from unless you want to work very specifically in those sectors that those schools and, and universities are aligned to. So as an example, getting uh, an MBA from say University of Michigan, where I got it from, uh, if you went to their Dearborn branch and you're in, in, uh, in the transportation industry, that would be a huge win for you because that's a direct tie. Otherwise it, it doesn't necessarily matter. That said, it does become kind of a, um, a voice amplifier because it's seen in, at least in the business management world as a kind of a, you're one of us <laughs> moments where, you know, oh, you've gone through all this, this language learning. Cause it's not rocket science by any means, you know, it's a, it's, it's a collection of ideas and concepts and, and management skills, some maths um, and, and just some uh, interpersonal skill sets that uh, crafts that particular degree. It's an older degree uh, an older credential, which is why it brings that kind of clout. Um, but that, that's kind of the primary why of would you want to, to have it. And uh, you know, being well-known in, in the physical therapy space as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, I'm asked all the time, like, did, did you do that to start a business? Like, no, you don't need an MBA to start a business. Uh, but what it does allow you to do is bridge the gap between, um, call it startup entrepreneurism and, and small business into the pre-early uh, enterprise and then true enterprise size uh, companies uh, to be able to... Um, Essentially, essentially act as a, a translator or interpreter uh, behind the, the, the intentions and, and the policies and the desires. And so I think that's really what it becomes is it, you, you become an effective uh, communicator between those lines of business. I love it. Uh, there was a lot of questions. I tried to tackle a couple of them during the session. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, if you didn't get your question answered. On behalf of the University of California, uh, thank you for joining us today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It was a pleasure to connect virtually with each of you. We appreciate you making time to be part of today's events and hope you gain some valuable insights and strategies into making career and life pivots. I'd like to thank Ben, Melody, and, and Peace uh, for the inspiration, for their time, generosity, commitment to the University of California. The insights and advice uh, you shared today made me especially proud to be part of the UC community. I hope you'll take a couple minutes to uh, provide feedback on today's event by following the survey link which appeared in your browser when you launched today's webinar. The feedback you provide uh, will help uh, improve the series and help the organizers select more topics. I know this one was a popular one, a lot of people requested it, for upcoming sessions. Uh, please visit ucal.us slash ACN for recordings of past webinars. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.